Can you hear me? Is it working? Good evening. Um, thank you for coming to this uh, event tonight. My name is uh, Mohammed Medullah. I, I work for the Stephanie Community Trust and I kind of uh, coordinated uh, this project. And front of me, we have uh, all these lovely people who brought uh, chapters in the book. We've got the program here, and uh, a really exciting uh, and enjoyable evening for you. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about this project about uh, East India Company and you know what we have been doing uh, last uh, ten years, I think, to try and um, uh, improve our understanding and of you know, the vast um, operation and influence and impact of this media company. Uh, it's something really, really vast and very complex. And once you get into one area, then you realize the other very interesting areas. You know? So we have been um, moving from one project to another, um, you know, one thing leading to another. Um, <coughs> It all started in 2007 when um, it was 250th anniversary of the Battle of Plassey. And when Brit Britain took over Bengal, and Bengal was the first place that the British actually conquered in militarily. So Bombay was the first possession of the British, of the East India Company, uh, which uh, Charles II got as a dowry you know, from, uh, Prince, uh, from the Portuguese when he married Portuguese princess was one of the gifts of that marriage. And then later on, Charles uh, leased uh, Bombay, you know, the East India Company. So the Bombay was the first position of the East India Company in, in India. Uh, but funnily, um, I don't know too much about it, I haven't done much service here, but the first position of uh, the British uh, in Asia was a tiny island. I don't know how people would find the island, but it was um, it was the only place where nutmeg used to grow, you know, full of run, very tiny island. Somehow the, the ruler there gave some kind of allegiance to the British, and then later on, um, British kind of claimed it um, in terms of trying to prevent the Dutch you know, from, from <coughs> um, claiming that, that part as well. <coughs> now. Um, so we, um, we ran a project at that time called Battle of Plassey Young People's Project. And it was that time when we uh, came into contact with the British Library. They've been very helpful, um, you know, showing us um, you know, what kind of resources they have <coughs> to in their company and how we can access them. And since then, we ran several projects. You know, we took a lot of people there. Um, you know, they learned about um, you know, the kind of archive and materials and, and how to access them. And, and <coughs> so through this process, we have been increasing interest and um, you know, generating awareness you know, about, uh, about learning history, about uh, you know, the importance of uh, knowing history. And, and you know, so it's kind of exciting. Uh, earlier on, um, I don't know if you probably didn't see, some of you might have, I was playing uh, some Indonesian uh, dance. It's called Piring. Tari Piring, Piring dance, right? It's from uh, West Sumatra. Now, what's the link with East India Company? The first voyage of East India Company actually went to Aceh. You know, the first port of um, call in Asia was in Aceh. And the, uh, the Aceh Sultan, uh, he entertained uh, the East India Company, you know, commanders, and Jeff Lancaster and his colleagues, gave them lavish dinner, you know, big entertainment, a lot of things, and dance and everything, right? Um, and then, uh, but they didn't find enough pepper in Aceh. So, Captain Lancaster, he sent his second in command uh, to go to Priyaman, you know, which is in West Matra, near Adan, to get um, more uh, spice, you know, from there, from pepper from there. Uh, in the sixth voyage of East India Company, the biggest ship that England ever built uh, hit some rocks 
not near the, in West Sumatra, near Tuko, which is not far from Panang and Freeman. Uh, so um, just showing you this dance from uh, West Sumatra, just a way of um, saying that you know this, this uh, early uh, East India Company officer, they might have seen those dances. <laughs> right. Another thing I want to say is that um, we, will, we I was trying to get some Chinese entertainment. Now China, there's a lot of links, you know, with this India Company in China, not only tea and, uh, and then the opium war, you know. The opium uh, smuggling in China. Uh, when the East India Company first got to <coughs> present the Indonesia Bantam, Ban English Valley Bantam, Indonesia Valley Bantam, there was a lot of Chinese people there. Mm -hmm. The Chinese were the ones who were actually engaged in business, you know, running the pepper plantation in Sumatra and you know, uh, doing all the kind of most of the businesses. And the local Sultan they used to encourage you know, the French to come because they used to generate business and there's a lot of uh, revenue used to come there. And also in Bantam every year, the big Chinese fleet used to come uh, with a lot of goods, you know, trading goods. And sometime, um, and then some Chinese used to go back. And when the you know, Chinese people, because they used to come single men in, in Bantam, they used to take local wives, you know. And then uh, when they used to go back, they used to leave their wife but take their children back to China. I wouldn't take the wives because they're Indonesian wives. You know? And during the first voyage of East India Company, Captain Lancaster, you know, he left 20 or 22 people uh, in Bantan, you know, to establish a like, settlement they call factory. The local ruler gave them two houses um, and also find, um, um, you know, uh, establish more like intelligent uh, and find more sources, you know, of uh, of. Uh, pepper and other spices and just uh, prepare for the next boy. And so um, most of the people that he left actually died. Uh, when the next voyage came, uh, one of the leading person who stayed in London, his name was Edmund Scott, and he wrote an account of his three years in, in Java, in, in, in London from uh, 1602 to 1603, sorry, five. He wrote a horrifying account you know, of, uh, uh, of his experience, right? And, but then he left a very detailed account of you know, people's customs, what they were, and he thought the Chinese had the worst singing voice in the world, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I thought, uh, uh, because I was trying to get a Chinese dancer, I couldn't get it at the end, so I'm going to show you some classical Chinese dance from YouTube later on, right? Uh, it's just a way of, you know, to show, you know, the, the links, you know, the East India Company links in, in Asia and China. Um, now, before we ask these lovely people here to talk about their experience, I want to invite Avalon, you know, from the uh, Can Albert Museum, where she actually provided, uh, you know, letters of award for me. Supported this project from the beginning, and also, uh, you know, um, we went there. You know, she uh, organized the workshops and the tour of uh, the object that they have. Um, before I invite, I just forgot one thing. This project was about East India Company objects, you know, kept at the Victor <coughs> and Albert, uh, one of their uh, storehouses <coughs> in uh, Olympia, for World Workers Center. And this project came uh, out of another project that we did when we were taken on a tour, a detailed tour, we looked at so many stuff and we thought, why don't we um, do a project you know, where people can look at some of the beautiful and interesting objects and discover you know, their origin and how they came here and some history about it. And so uh, this project uh, was the result of that. And this, the focus of this project was uh, each of the participants had to choose one object uh, at the museum archive, museum storehouse. And then, uh, you know, undertake research and write something interesting, whatever uh, they find interesting, whatever they discover. Can I invite Avalon to come and say something about it? I'm excited to read it. <laughs> um, the V&A 
is always extremely grateful for the opportunity to engage with local and communities. We try really, really hard to find opportunities to do that, and so we're um, in debt to Mohammed <coughs> coming to us with ideas as to how we can go about doing that. We, we strive to be the world's uh, leading museum of art and design, but in order to do that, we really need to invite dialogues with people who can help us tell the histories of our objects with new perspectives and new voices. We have about 150,000 objects in the Asian department of the BNA, so there is ample opportunity for you to contribute to us telling the stories of those objects. And I would encourage all of you to please come and help us learn more about what it is that we have and how it connects to all of our shared histories. Thank you very much. I did see Margaret somewhere. Margaret makes it. Do you mind coming and say something? Because uh, she's from British Library and they've been in a house with us and this library is a really, really <coughs> important treasure house for information. We have nine miles of records in the <laughs> office records. <laughs> so there's plenty there. So, but what we really liked about this project that it was, yeah, we've got the, the documents and Avalon and her team have got the stuff, because lots of this was in the India Museum at East India House, and then it, it was dispersed. So it's really wonderful to link up the things, you know, to try and um, bring the two collections back together. I think that's what we were really thrilled with for this project. So, thank you. 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 Thank it was called uh, How Villages and Towns in Bengal Dressed London Ladies in the 17th, 18th and early 19th centuries. And uh, 13, um, about 12 people, um, they spent nearly two years, you know, hand sewing and everything, produced some really wonderful uh, dresses. And I was showing the video earlier on. And two ladies over there and Sai, they were involved with the project. Oh, three, sorry. <laughs> Munta, Lifa, and Lucky, and Sai. So they uh, they were involved with a previous project, uh, and sometimes you know some uh, project leads to other things as well. Uh, and that project led to a wonderful initiative in Bangladesh, you know, where they uh, developed uh, a massive exhibition on uh, muslin, and they're trying to recreate uh, in a muslin, uh, you know, to the quality that existed before. So they're making a real good effort and they produced a wonderful documentary. Um, okay, now, um, I think uh, since uh, Nasima came last, I will give you last, yeah? We'll start from this side. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start? Yeah, I'll start. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much.
Hey, my name is Lothar. Um, I did a piece on the Bengali culture, sorry. Um, my choice there was I wanted to focus on the Bengal. I just finished my dissertation, focus on the Bengal family. As you know, the Bengal has a rich history. <coughs> so I want to do um, so one. We went over to the BNA, we saw four fabrics, and um, I want to find out if there was a fabric or if there was a method of there was a ritual that was tied to the bingo, to a fabric, and that's when I found out about the bingo in um, sorry. Um, it's unique in the sense that it takes motive from what's happening around the region. So you can have some that will have like Hindu rituals or Hindu stories, to some that will have a like, European on steamboat. So with the sorry tell the period which what was happening in the region. So I found a sorry which had European steamboats. So Philip can see the Europeans and the in the company come into the room <coughs> and how the local see it saw them. So on my sorry you can see like natives rowing the boat while Europeans were being fanned by them. Um, I think you guys can read the rest, that you don't want to give too much away. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much why I kind of tied to the Bengal, through the station, the heritage. I'd like to ask uh, any questions. So, uh, no, no, that's okay, that's okay. So that, that style of sari goes back a couple of hundred years. Do you think that maybe today they could make some that, that reflects today's Van Gogh? It's actually a project that I want to focus on. Um, it's seen as a dying art. Um, how I do have an idea and I do want it to be revived is they say there is not really any master weavers left. If so, they are really locally based and be hard to find. Because um, it's like a really unique type of method. It does from the silk thread and then it shows itself. Um, there's a lot of obstacles. I do believe there is a. to the whole. Um, that's something that we're going to explore in the future. Hopefully, if we can, we can make motives around current affairs in the next world. I know. Cool. One more. Um, so are they silk or cotton? <coughs> silk. So the unique thing is the old friends were silk. And that's what they were known for. The bamboo was known for having the richest silk in the world at that period of time. Which is why it's a bit more harder for it to revive. Because the silk production by the time because of the history and then the company is done. so much of the, the DNA um, that it was quite overwhelming at points. But in the end, I found a, a drawing um, which was of a Maharaja called Sonsal Chand, um, who was from uh, Kendal State um, in, it's in, it's in Chal Pradesh. Um, and I set about trying to find out as much as I could about the drawing, so I was able to find out um, the historical details about the Maharaja and his um, and his son, who were sort of pictured. Um, it was a drawing that was annotated on the back by someone called William Moorcroft, who was a, a veterinary surgeon working for the British Army. Uh, in India. So I was able to find out a little bit about him as well. Um, and then I tried to find out how the drawing may have come to the v &A, which was very difficult. Um, I was able to find William Moorcroft's journals 
at the British Library. Uh, and obviously, it's, I was reading from his perspective. He's shown us very, very detailed about all of the places that he visited in, in India. But it's very much, like I say, his, his perspective. Um, looking at the people and the land sort of through his eyes. Um, but what also helped a lot was um, I, I went to the BNA archives where there are acquisition files. And in the acquisition file, I was able to find when it was bought by the BNA, who bought it, and find some details that way. But it was a, a sort of fascinating bit of, sort of research. And it, having sort of read about the history, it then became very meaningful, thanks to the BNA, who let me see the, the drawing itself, and to be able to get up close to it and see the very fine detail um, of, of the eyes, and you could see that the Maharaj and his son were, were wearing um, very fine uh, muslin over the top of their sort of clothes, and so <coughs> it was um, very, it's a very interesting experience, and I'm so very grateful to the Stephanie Community Trust for sort of giving me this opportunity. Any questions? There were books that were written, some uh, some by sort of Indian scholars, so that helped. But I, I think because I was, I, I found the journals, and so I was referring to the journals a lot. Whereas I didn't have something on the Maharaja's side saying this is, you know, this is my perspective. I was I was looking at secondary sources about the Maharaja rather than primary sources. It was, I mean, it was interesting because looking at the painting um, in, in the books I read about that where the painting is mentioned, it was. Uh, this archer who said that it was a drawing made in the Canberra state, but by somebody from Jammu. But which to me seems a bit strange because Canberra is, is in the Himalayas, so it's very magnificent. <coughs> um, whereas looking at the green, that's to me it looked a bit like it would be plains rather than the mountainous area. But looking at the painting itself, I mean, it was just there was no. So pattern, it was it was just it was a green section. So, so it wasn't like um, any the landscape. Just no, not at all. Right. Which is when I looked at some mm. other sort of miniatures from the area, then that's something that was so very noticeable was that it sort of reflected the local mm. the local mm. landscape. Yes, and I sort of think, sort of being involved in this, I and it's kind of weird because my family doesn't know anyone anything about this person and until I, a couple of years ago, I found a photo and I started looking at ancestry and I thought, oh, you know, this is the name that goes with this photo. So, um, and it turns out that I have a great, great, great sort of uncle who was also a veterinary surgeon. So I think sort of going through the journals that I've found and being involved in the process has, has helped me to look at what I'm reading about him in a different perspective, if that makes sense. So. I'm sort of able to put his 
being in the Punjab as something that, you know, I, 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 that where I am sort of looking at it from, like I said, a different perspective, not just from um, perspective of thinking that he's a vet sort of going off to the Punjab, he was actually sort of there and involved in a machine that was very, that was very repressive and oppressive. Um, so, just quite sobering for me to know that there is something that in my family that made that sort of wrong. <coughs> I uh, selected about five different textile pieces at the cloth workers and there was one that I was really drawn to and it was a turban um, which had a really special tie-dye technique to it, uh, maybe zigzags. Why I was so drawn to it I guess was not only because of the colour which was dyed in indigo but because um, it was from an area in the south of India, uh, Madras, uh, which it was unusual for that area to have uh, tie-dye um, done. Usually it was from Rajasthan in the north. Uh, so I chose this because I was very curious to understand how it is that this piece was made in an area that usually didn't have the technique um, practiced. Uh, through my research I discovered um, I had a lot of fantasy about how this could have made its way to Madras, but uh, I found out along the way that potentially it could have been a showpiece, um, uh, which was exhibited in, in Paris, and uh, was later then transferred to um, the Indian Museum here. My piece comes at the end of uh, the East Indian Company, so around 1855 to 1871, that's when uh, the time. Um, the piece, um, I don't know, it was really a special time for me because I could travel to India during the context of this project. So I got to spend time in the Indigo uh, dye unit there uh, in the area in Tamil Nadu. And um, so my uh, essay uh, also covers that, in the, covers that in the book. Um, Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Um, did you show a picture of the piece to the Indigo Dye Studio? That you I did, yes. Um, they <laughs> said they, they gave me numerous people that I should talk to in the area. They were really uh, impressed by the technique itself. They were, um, yeah, they, yeah, the they were really like, wow, this is really, really high quality for that region. Um, and they also were quite proud also that it uh, withstood the, the color restate with time, which for natural dyes, that's something that is the, the thing that the light and both time eats it. So uh, if you can look in the book that the color really still stays almost like a deep denim blue. And uh, so yeah, they were really proud in a way to see that. Yeah. You want to call out your own. Just one quick question. I'm going to talk about the indigo. Uh, did you manage to uh, hit on the um, the actual indigo trade? Yes, I did. And, and and all the issues that went along with that. Yeah. A lot of revolts and, and yeah. It's something that I also touched on a little bit. It's a different topic that to be covered. Um, of course, that's what's so wonderful. And uh, my, my actually the title of my piece is called Nila, and it's uh, which the name it's Sanskrit for indigo. And what is fascinating about the word itself, Nila, through the whole of its history, from not even the whole trade of it kind of all the names, which all the countries that it had been from, from wherever it was from Africa, attached this name, Nila, or forms of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, so you can follow the trade history through both its name and... Uh, it's quite fascinating. 
it's very fascinating. So there was a to to elaborate a little bit further. There was a blue mutiny, which is um, uh, it's something I didn't focus on. It's, it's a different topic. So uh, it's basically when there was an uprising between the peasants and the farmers, and it was a very corrupt time. Uh, which in Madras, that was wonderful about Madras, that they had a kind of different system that was in Bengal and uh, North. They had a different system in place, which gave more, um, the middleman was lost, and therefore the farmers could make more money. And uh, so in a way, that's so good that that happened. So I kind of focus more on that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. One thing, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of uh, Stephanie Trust, I was supposed to invite uh, him to say a few things, uh, but we'll, we'll do it after this session. Hello, I'm Charlotte. Um, I'm Charlotte Lee. I'm the Director of Ivory Workbox, which is in the form of a cottage. Um, it, is, it was overwhelming to try and actually decide which object or which thing I was going to write about. So I was wandering around the V&A and decided to just let the object find me. So um, this intriguing um, cottage, um, as I say, was, was, it was just a marriage of, of the two different worlds, something producing ivory in, in this um, far-reaching place on the earth, um, but then it looking like a very, very traditional English cottage. And um, when it first came um, to the V&A, it was thought to be um, English um, Tunbridge ware, and it was uh, produced in the 18th century, and it was very similar to um, items produced in Kent. Um, but it was originally from Vizagapatam, which is on the, the Coromandel coast, um, and this was, um, I, I've tried to, to think about how it might have come from there to um, the UK and it was, it was very hard to unpack its journey and actually discover through documents how, how that journey was made but I did find from an acquisition file at the V&A the antique dealer's name which was Roger Warner who was a very famous antique dealer in the Cotswolds um, and his archives were deposited in the Leeds archives um, Brotherton Library um, in, um, in, in Leeds in the, in the special collections and um, I looked at their, their stock books and managed to find out that this particular item was first bought by him from Boscombe um, in Bournemouth so it's a Shippies um, antiques dealer um, and they, uh, they had sold it to, to, to Roger Warner. So that, that was an interesting part of the research for me, being able to go around all the different archives and discover something that perhaps someone hadn't found out before, but it was difficult to get um, a concrete um, journey from East India Company um, to England, but I did look at some more documents in the British Library, some of the wills and inventories um, from Madras, which was a major trading centre, um, and that obviously had uh, similar items that came over from there to, to the UK. So. Yeah, that was that was as much as I could go with with that level of research. But I want to thank all the archives that I went to. Um, so it's British Library, V&A, Leeds, and uh, London Metropolitan Archives. Um, in, in all of and Tunbridge Wells actually were very good at, at doing distance communication with me. Um, but it was a, it was a great experience for that reason. Thank you. about yeah. picking ivory and then I thought I need to give something back so yeah I did I did adopt, adopt it more about <laughs> 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 I didn't trade like how bad it was earlier um, yeah I, I thought it didn't want to get too much into that because you just go off on a different tangent you could go on so many different levels but yeah clearly it was it was awful it was in, in that respect but it was a huge trade and um, I think in the, in the book as, as an excerpt from the British Library from, from the wills from the inventories to show you all the, the elephant's teeth that were being sold to make, make such objects. Five people talking about their 
experience in subject areas. Um, the funding we got for this project was from uh, Heritage Lottery. It's a very low budget project. Uh, and the theme under, um, uh, sorry, uh, under, how do you say it? The theme, uh, there were different themes, right? And this particular theme for this project, where you got funding from, is called Sharing Heritage. Um, and you know, Heritage Lottery has been also very nice to us. They gave us funding several times. Uh, and um, so this is uh, just like the thing that is not <laughs> uh, Now, are you right? He was a bit nervous. He was saying, can he escape? But he's, he's an actor, so I'm not going to get You can sit there. <laughs> As Dr. Uh, Villa pointed out, I, I, this is one of my weakness, um, just public speaking. I just get, my mind just goes blank and I get very nervous. Um, I'll give it to anyway. Um, thank you all for coming this evening, taking the time out to join us. Um, it was a very interesting sort of uh, period for me, um, and an interesting journey for me to get involved with this project um, and discovering a lot of facts and all tr um, treasures that are sort of stored in the VMA Joint Worker Centre. Um, there's a lot of objects such as chairs, um, <coughs> tables, um, Jewelries um, and many other treasures like painting. Um, so I, I decided to sort of um, uh, focus on a, a painting, a particular painting, which is a miniature painting of a, of a Bengal Noir uh, by the name of Amir Kasim Ali Khan. I don't know if anyone knows him. Does anyone know him? He's not very popular in Noir, unlike um, uh, Siraj Dola or, or Amir Jaffa. Um, so I decided to sort of uh, look into his life uh, and I did a very short chapter on him because. Uh, primarily because I I joined the project at the last moment. Um, I had a few things um, that was going on in my life. Um, so <coughs> I, it was a last moment decision to come on board. Um, so I, I decided to sort of um, focus on this miniature painting um, about Mir Jafar, sorry, about um, Mir Kasim Khan, who is in fact the uh, son-in-law of Mir Jafar. And Mir Jafar is sort of um, seen as somewhat of a, of a villain in, in, in Bengal because of what he's um, done and I don't want to go into his story because it would be a very quite contentious one as well. Um, but Mir Kasim is somewhat of a hero uh, 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 um, which is quite a contrast. Um, so he actually, his, his, his period of Namabshi was very short. He's only, he only ruled Bengal for about three years I believe from 1760 to 63. Um, uh, and during this period, he tried to he tried to sort of bring about changes in terms of equality, because one of the main themes during his life was that um, the British uh, East India Company were sort of um, uh, getting away with trading without paying any taxes, um, whereas the local merchants and other foreign merchants had to pay taxes. So this was quite um, this was seen by American Samudipanas. A very unequal and uh, oppressive. So he he uh, he went about trying to sort of uh, redress those kind of inequalities that existed at his time, um, which led on to sort of uh, tensions being built up between him and the company, uh, which eventually led into a little uh, a war, um, where unfortunately, uh, well, you know, where Mirkasim lost the battle and uh, he had to sort of leave. Um, he had to leave. Uh, okay, so he had to leave uh, Musharabad to uh, another Musharabad. Uh, Musharabad to another city, sir, um, <coughs> where he, he he eventually died. So it's a very short period. Um, his life was very short, and I thought it was quite interesting to kind of look at the, the sort of social aspects and the campaign that he was le um, leading. Um, and and another another reason why I chose to do miniatures because. I um, um, I also like art and I do art and I've done I've done this, um, some miniature painting myself, so which kind of drew, drew me into this uh, painting. Thank you. Do you think there's any parallel between the um, 
East India Company's approach to uh, free trade and tariffs and that of, say, uh, Donald Trump today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to go into um, politics or anything <laughs> such. Um, uh, it was another period at another time. Um, they have to deal, deal with their issues, and um, Donald Trump is in our time, and, but it's completely different subjects. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into politics. Thank you, anyway. I'm um, just wondering what the exact size was of the miniature painting, like how small is it? Uh, the, uh, the exact details are not there, so if you, if you okay. yeah, I can't remember both of them. I think it's by 30, 30 centimeters by 20. I can't remember the exact <coughs> Bashkar is the next one. He, he actually offered, but then he, he just went against his uh, word last time. He was going to cook some uh, uh, old recipe for us. Because <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's, he's been researching on uh, uh, what is it, historical cuisines or recipes. So maybe one day we, he, he might cook for all of us. <laughs> That's the fun part because, uh, you know, I never had a topic that I could research that I could eat. <laughs> you know, uh, so Eric has got the background to this. Um, and uh, perhaps unlike uh, most of my colleagues over here, um, the object that I'm talking about uh, contains something from India which uh, the East India Company brought back, but it actually is not there now. It's just a company. And uh, this was fascinating. Uh, these are not big graters. And at one point in time, uh, especially in the early 18th century, pretty much anybody who was somebody would be carrying around these not big graters in their pocket. Um, it used to be a mark of a uh, sophistication that you could um, take uh, take out this not big grater, and it would have. Uh, nutmeg inside and then you would offer to grate it on people's food or, or drinks. <laughs> and it was considered to be a completely acceptable uh, social uh, social activity. If somebody does that to me right now, I'm going to say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, but it was fascinating to see this. First, uh, if you walk around the VNA, uh, I, I was thinking about you know, uh, looking at the, the plots, uh, the furniture, etc., etc., and then this thing came up, and when you start thinking about it, it became so personal that I just got attracted to it. And as in how you start to research, this is not about the the, the big big men theory of history. It's about the day to day uh, sort of lives of English women and English men who would uh, cook food, go out for picnics, uh, meet people at Vauxhall Gardens and they would have a nutmeg grater in the pocket. Uh, <coughs> Nutmegs, uh, as Sophia Mohamed was talking about, um, has got a very, very strange uh, connection to British history. Um, uh, quite a lot of people might know that uh, we won the island of, um, uh, of Manhattan of the Dutch in the second uh, Anglo-Dutch war. And it was all related to the island in East Indies. Which, uh, which, which Muhammad was talking about, and that used to grow nutmeg. So that was one of the examples as to how <coughs> the British uh, history is so intimately connected with, with spices. It goes back even longer. Uh, the first mention, uh, mention of spices in British history was a Roman soldier in Windolanda in 70 AD, uh, who's, uh, they used to write it in small, uh, uh, wooden parts, and in his uh, list of things he had uh, in his inventory were uh, Indian pepper. So from there, the, the concept of having Indian spices or, um, or uh, sort of nutmeg in, in particular is strangely connected in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways. Um, <coughs> another factoid, um, Connecticut, the, the, the US state, is called as the nutmeg state. And not because the, um, the American captains who would be actually participating in the East India Company trade were bringing nutmegs ac across, but because they were counterfeiting nutmegs by making them out of wood. <laughs> so it, it became very famous. 
so anyway, that's that's how all these documents came in, and uh, I sat down uh, looking at all the ledgers uh, uh, at, at the British Library where you could see that tiny spidery handwriting talking about this particular ship bringing so many pieces of nutmeg across. They would be landed uh, on the <coughs> London Pool or in the East India Company docks. Uh, then went and looked at um, so, you know, the, the, the criminal records in the Old Bailey, and people would steal nutmegs, even just a couple of nutmegs slightly sort of, you know, uh, secreted around in the groin area would be enough. I know, uh, but right, that's what this puzzle did. <laughs> and it would be enough for three days' wages. So uh, quite a lot of, uh, sort of you know, uh, customs elements and, and, and safety and security started to develop because of that. The other thing that I started to see was these were made out of silver. And previously, uh, the UK never had silver or the ability to do silversmithing. So first was a huge amount of silver started to flow through from the Latin American uh, empire, Spanish empire, to pay for these spices. It came to here, and also after the French Revolution, where a lot of the Huguenots came and settled in, in, in and around this area, actually. And they started to make these very, very fine uh, silver objects. The final thing that I wanted to say was, uh, which I found out was, pockets didn't exist. For a very long period of time, British clothing or Western European clothing didn't have pockets people would actually put all their goods in, in, a, in, a, in a bag and tie it around their, their waist. But because they carried around rather expensive stuff like this, they started to come up with pockets, which was soon on top of uh, their clothes. And, um, and, and you would just carry them around. Um, so yeah, uh, very small, very tiny, uh, very personal um, something, an object that's in the VNA, which people would use three, four times a day. Uh, so, small piece of history. Thank you. Nashkar, I read um, that at one time, uh, nutmeg was uh, more expensive than gold in weight. Have you got anything to say on that? Um, it is. I mean, one of the reasons why I would say in the <coughs> 14th and 15th century where most of the world's explorations happened was because of spices. Uh, gold is uh, extremely difficult to excavate. Natural gold is very difficult to find, especially in the nugget area, uh, in, the, in the gold nuggets. So if you were talking about international trade, um, spices would be it. So at that point in time, uh, carrying spices was the, in a very small area, you could have a very high value good. So people would actually use nutmegs to uh, and, and other spices as, as, as a traded good. The other problem was that nutmegs, because they were small but they were hard as well, they were perfect for ballast. So from here, woolen goods would go out to India and Asia. But when they were coming back, you would have all the stuff packed in boxes. But boxes would move, especially in the wooden ships. So they would put nutmegs around the around the boxes to just keep the uh, good safe and also to provide ballast. But yes, very, very <coughs> expensive and very good trading material. Thank you. Any question? Can you, um, Basker, can you uh, articulate a little bit more about Run Island and uh, Manhattan and about how the trade trade off? Can you, you know, <coughs> so uh, there's a very interesting. Uh, okay, where do I start? <laughs> Uh, the Dutch actually, uh, when they had the VOC, which was their equivalent of uh, East India Company, the Dutch East India Company actually was almost about four times the size of the East India Company. Uh, people generally don't recognize it, but it was huge. Uh, they were also, I would say, at least about three to four times more brutal than the British. And at one point in time, they actually had a huge massacre of English um, English merchantmen and uh, sort of, you know, sailors in a small uh, place called as uh, Ambona. That, in the 17th century, became a huge, huge issue. 
I mean, we are going something like that at this moment with, with Russia. You can just imagine how, sort of, you know, the, the sense of jingoism and sort of, you know, somebody attacked us. But at, at those, that, that time, you had quite a lot of very, very bad press uh, because the Dutch actually attacked quite a lot of British uh, sailors and merchantmen and, and killed them actually in a, in a very bad way. That was one of the reasons behind the Second Anglo-Dutch War. And as a terms of settlement, the idea was that it was very difficult for the British to defend Rome because it was just one island, the rest of the islands in the Banda Island chain belonged to the Dutch. So to make a sort of, you know, uh, uh, benefit out of something that was bad, they said, okay, you can have the island of Rome. So they gave it away to the Dutch, but instead you give us the island of Manhattan. But the trick that the British played uh, was that at, at night, um, they actually dug up whole trees of the nutmeg, uh, nutmeg tree, put them in, in, in ships, and then they took them around and then planted them in various um, plantations in Sri Lanka and, and India, etc., etc. So they literally gave away by what time it was a worthless island and gained the nutmeg uh, tree as well as the island of Manhattan. So that's that's a background. Just, just another piece of information that I read somewhere uh, linked to this. Um, there was a there was a guy. Uh, it's on the internet. I picked this up from the internet. He looked at uh, sale of uh, slaves, you know, in uh, the capital of Arakan and and some of the other slave markets in in India, like in. Uh, Pipli in um, Orissa. Uh, so Dutch uh, records shows uh, you know the number of slaves that they were buying from uh, Arakan slave market, and a lot of the slaves that they were buying they were <coughs> Bengalis, Bengalis, but they were captured you know by the Portuguese and the Arakanis, and they were selling them in in the Arakan slave market. So when um, apparently the Dutch killed nearly. Uh, probably 80% of the people of those Nakmeg Island, Banda Island, uh, because they refused to um, sort of deal with the Dutch um, under the arrangement that Dutch were trying to establish. They were happy with the system that they had with the Portuguese before. Uh, and some of the people who, who were not killed, they escaped to neighboring island. But when they took Bengali slaves, to work in Nutmeg Island, they it, it just didn't work, and a lot of them starved and died, and you know disease and things like that. Um, so I didn't follow it up to see how uh, it was managed you know, later on. So there's an interesting story of the Dutch buying Bengali slaves from Arakan slave market, captured by the Portuguese and the Arakanis, and taking them to Banda Islands where they they starved to death. Anyway, any other question to the person? <laughs> We move on to Sagar. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Sagar Pasmaya. So my story was the Kamishira, Kami Shima story, which is about the story of the outfit the samurai would uh, wear on top of the traditional kimono. Uh, so for me, a concurrent thing, uh, because I've done the other two stories before this one, which was the um, fiction story, uh, the love story, and then also the story about the ships as well. So part of the reason, well, the main reason I've got interest into the um, project of uh, Amadola with East India uh, was my interest in industrial hemp. And I saw that as a really good tool to actually tell stories about industrial hemp. Um, because before I started writing these stories, um, anyone, anytime I would be telling uh, people stories about him, then people would think that um, you know, they, they think that this guy's talking about drugs. You know? um, so um, it's changed a lot in the last few years, but there's still a lot of uh, negative connotations. But with the stories I've written uh, before this one, um, which was reflecting on hundreds of years of history of East India Company, his, um, the industrial hemp played a major, major role 
for the East India Company in terms of the ships. So coming to the um, v and um, I was like, OK, well, I need to find an item, which I'm sure there is going to be an item which is going to be made from him. Um, I wasn't really sure. Um, and it was really difficult to find in the museum or even looking on the website. Um, and also finding the item which was in that time period as well. But then I came up with the item which was the Japanese item the samurai had to wear. And um, in terms of doing the research, it was very difficult. Um, uh, even when I've done my other stories, finding research on hemp for ships is very tiresome, very difficult to find that information. Um, and the same with the uh, Kanishima. Um, so I've gone through a lot of uh, internet research, um, sort of calling up Japanese embassy, um, found some random documentaries I've found on BBC, which had done a uh, documentary covering uh, Kanishima and uh, how they, not the Kanishima, but the kimono, how they're being revived. Um, and it took quite a few months to do the research and then actually piecing together um, all the information. Um, I would say sort of piecing together all the research for this story was pretty much um, how, pro probably, well probably not as difficult, but just about as difficult as trying to figure out how to put on the Kanishima itself, um, which is when I was reading the stories, then uh, even, the, even that process of wearing an item like that was quite complicated. Um, and um, if I could just read um, not section but for me one of the key things which was really quite poignant um, which I've written in one of the first pages uh, which really also attracted me to the history of not the not just the samurai but also the Japanese history um, which I've written here was, was the, the pleats of the Hakama uh, which was um, the way the Kanishima was designed. Um, and he was basically saying that they are believed, the, the items on the front of the Kanishima are believed to symbolize the virtues of the samurai. Um, and those virtues were courage, benevolence, justice, courtesy, loyalty, and honor. And um, that's also what attracted to me. Um, even when I've uh, met friends from Japan and India many years ago, um, that's sort of re really empowered my interest in uh, uh, sort of history of Japan and all. Um, they have a lot of honor. And that's, that's what the samurai were really all about. Um, you know, a lot of people probably see um, the movies which is talking about the samurai with the sword and you know, sort of like worry that um, there, were, there was a lot of honor um, for them because they were there to actually protect and conserve the, the heritage and the preservation of the area. Um, and um, yeah, so it sort of took quite, quite a lot of uh, time to get the information together. And um, yeah, apart from that, um, I was, you know, I, was uh, I didn't, you know, I was like trying to figure out what, what, what sort of things to wear today. Um, and I was like, I haven't got a Kanishima, I haven't got a kimono. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll just put on my hemp t shirt and my hemp shirt, which is probably nothing on the items of the Japanese, but um, it was just to symbolize the um, hemp. Um, and for me, also, in addition to the history of the, the samurai items, um, hemp uh, sort of really um, bears a very strong uh, connection to me. Um, the main reason I've gone to all of these projects was to, not just to tell a story about hemp and make it more interesting and you know, show people that there's another side to it, not the side that is misinterpreted. But also um, show the environmental uh, benefits, which is one of my key interests. Um, you know, I tell people about hemp, okay, you know, this guy is talking about drugs, blah, 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 okay, very boring. And some people, okay, you know, have you got something to smoke? It's like, no, I um, but, you moving beyond that, if you then look in the last few years, people are really, um, you know, from any race or religion, people are like, okay, well, what are we doing environmentally? 
we, we've got an interest, but we don't really know. And all the research I've done from the last few hundred years from East Indian Company was quite astonishing um, that even though the British were not looking at this uh, material as an environmental crop, it was very fundamental to their ships hundreds of years later. Um, it's the other way around. It's, we, we don't know much about it, even though it's a major part of uh, British and English and Irish uh, and Scottish and Welsh history. Uh, we just, it's not that we don't know about it, we've just forgotten our history. And it's probably the thing um, in today, in 2018, where we need to learn more about it. Because we, we've got so much more, we're still living in so much more troubled times environmentally. And just one last thing, because he's nudging me on there. <laughs> um, is um, when I found the item which is to do with the samurai, then it also had another connection for me. So if you look at my surname, S U N A R I A, if you switch around the U and the A and the I and the A, then you get samurai. So um, that's just a that's just a side connection, but um, yeah, it's, it's sort of got quite close connection for me. So thanks very much. Can any other windows be open? Can anybody help? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any question to Sagar? I didn't really research that much into it um, because um, it was very little time and uh, it, was, it was difficult to find the information itself. But when we uh, were talking about the Indigo, she was asked the question. I did sort of think that, okay, well, that, that's another area, but it's little time, but it's, it's an area that probably will uh, affect on Google research. And also, in terms of um, what someone else was asking about further projects, that we really want to build on it. You know, I've got contacts in other countries where I'd like to actually get the material, like the hemp material, get it into the UK and then revive, you know, a project which is building about this. I just want to briefly say this um, paper that you've got, which has uh, got the program printed on it, for the last three projects I've been sort of harassing I'm doing it to actually get this printed because this is, um, this is tree feed uh, hemp paper. So it's not regular timber paper. Um, so this is significant in the East Indian Company because all Bibles, um, all church Bibles were printed on hemp paper. So if you put it out against the light, you should be able to see the design, and that is a hemp cannabis relief. <laughs> so if you can see it, you can see it in some parts, you can't. But that was a very common theme of hemp paper for thousands of years, especially in the UK um, and around the world. So paper, the Mona Lisa, the Picasso, are all painted on hemp. And that's why they lasted so long. But uh, th thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Just, uh, just one thing, I'm uh, probably doing very bad time management. We've got a really exciting uh, program, so don't, uh, don't leave, yeah? <laughs> Uh, my name is Sai from Asmari and I wrote about two sort of legacy from the sports of empire which is on page 99 for those who've got a book. Um, what's, what I found interesting about the process in itself is um, uh, it's very difficult to look at the history of South Asia through one item um, because all of us come with all sorts of ideas and all sorts of corners um, and specialisms. So I was, uh, I was a little bit affected by, because uh, I did a lot of campaigning in my own time, and I was very affected by the changes happening in our built environment, such as the um, high-rise buildings and so forth. And if you look at the East End in particular, uh, there's a lot of changes and uh, a reduction of what is more ethnic minority spaces. So, um, so I was looking around and saying, well, actually, where are all the all the Asian Asian buildings? You know, what, where's all the Bengali buildings? Where's you know? So I was kind of had a look at that, and then I realised actually the last significant one I saw was two years ago in Bangalore. Um, which was Tipu Sultan's uh, Summer Palace, which is a wooden palace, which is on page 101 of those kind of books. Um, and I thought, well, hang on a minute. How comes we go around the globe and we see lots of English buildings and so forth, but we don't have any Asian buildings or Indian architects uh, building out right the um, Indian buildings in Britain? So um, my kind of avenue of looking at that came through that prison, essentially. So. 
Tipper Sultan was a very complex character, and I'm sure everyone has their own point of view on it, and he's it's, um, it's quite caricatured here in the West. But interestingly, he did beat the British in various things, um, which, includes, um, which includes a couple of wars, um, and then he got a bit bored, and he lost. So um, but he, his cannons were, um, were top of the range, and from that, the British learned to lock out advancement in cannon um, warfare. So I looked at a series of items which had essentially been looted or plundered um, um, from Tipu Sultan's palaces. So if we have a look at the history of Tipu Sultan, a lot of the items in the VNA and in the archives are very much um, were taken from from the palaces um, by all the soldiers, and they were in fact shared by royalty as well. So apparently the King of England has a copy of the Quran somewhere as well. So and that's Tipu Sultan's Quran. So. Uh, rather than kind of broadly, um, sorry, rather than um, empire bashing or anything like that, I did try and look at it through the prism of objects in itself and what objects survived there and what can they tell us about it, what's happening now. Um, and Tipper Sultan was an interesting character. Again, he, he was one of those um, guys who had to be toppled. So um, he was almost like a Saddam, or he was painted as a Saddam of our times. You know, there was a dodgy dossier there. He had his weapons of mass destruction destruction, which were with cannons, and so forth. So um, um, it, it was interesting to kind of make those parallels between what's happening now and um, where South Asian archive is in the British archives. Thank you. Any question? Okay. I've been to the Mexican Palace of Soviet Union. There's certainly not Saddam Hussein in the States. You're a really secure man. To in your book, I think they have an initial round of In your book, you didn't have capture the sword of Tibu Sultan anywhere? No, I, I, one of the items I wanted to see was a sword. One of the items I wanted to see was a sword, but I, I touched on six other ones, so and I've only had a link to that. I mean, you could write a whole book about it, but not a couple of books. I, I found a lot in the Solas archives. It's good to write about it. So it's, it's quite a book. There's a quote about Tibu Sultan's sword. To actually collect all the swords that were labeled as belong to Tipu Sultan, we could have armed the entire India with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you will do the same thing about the couple of them. Yes. You talked about Tipu Sultan, so you talked about how he is caricature today. I just wanted in terms of um, <coughs> schools, in the schools and education. How that character, particularly in English history education, stacks up against some of the things we've talked about. For example, the bravery, the innovation in terms of the civil war, and other things. Yeah, so that is, to me, it comes across as that's a bit of a reality. There's certainly a perception of him that comes across in the English British culture, and the education is different. How can we address it? Question. I mean, I, I think we all know that history is, you know, written by the, um, the picture, you know. <laughs> so we have to be critical of that. I think um, when we when we're critical of the East India Company, I mean, it's it's normal. I mean, I work in education now, so we're constantly telling you know, you know, many students, you've got to learn to critique things. You know, you've got to just because you're from Asia doesn't mean you have to have a certain mindset about how you view the British and come and do it here, you know, take it apart. And I think uh, that's that's happening. And what was nice about the, and participating in a project like this, that it was happening through a very small microcosm, you know, and Tim Sultan was a very um, complex character for his time, and he was right in the middle of what was essentially, you know, a really difficult time for South Asia, you know, and so he, he did his self-branding, I talked a little bit about his self-branding with the Bowery um, Tiger um, emblems and so forth, and in fact the British were a little bit afraid of him right, for, a, for quite a long period, because he, um, he managed to um, he, I mean, I, lo I talk a lot about his uh, um, his legacy, his dad's legacy, Haider Ali's, um, and through to his, uh, we're talking about a 40 year period. And in that, how um, essentially they influenced a lot of the architecture and the arts as well. And so, and obviously in English society, that's seen as quite an important aspect of which can be. If you take it there, then you're really you know, stepping into the ring. You know, so, so. Uh, it's, it's interesting, and I think it's interesting how we're going to recompile that picture of him as well. So in the end, it wasn't an object, it was a person that I was taking apart. Thank you. Hi, I'm 
everyone. Um, my name is Sophia Islam. Um, thank you for coming. It's really nice to see that so many people are as interested in this project as we have So my chapter is on page 81, if you want to see the picture of my object. Um, I chose this cotton, uh, it's either a bed hanging or a wall hanging. Um, it was embroidered with colourful silk. Um, and I, it's funny because we've all chosen quite different objects, but I always kind of knew I wanted to do this project because I was very interested in textiles, especially the DNA. Um, so I've chosen the textiles object, and um, I've been very interested in how it's linked to both the history in the UK um, and in India. Um, so the themes I kind of touched on were the themes of kind of influence and control and power between those two nations, that, although this is the nations now, um, and I looked at that in terms of the designs behind this item, um, and so the different influences on that design from both sides, um, control over the processes of how the world is obeyed, um, so once that became increasingly popular in India, it kind of got overtaken by the English cotton producers, um, and then finally I looked at once the object would have been bought and was in England, um, the influence that, that it's, it's quite a luxury item and it was in a, a kind of stately home um, and so how the item itself then contributed to an image of power as well. So uh, luckily I, I, I found out where the object ended up um, and it was at Ashburnham House in Sussex um, and I looked a little bit into the history of the family, the Ashburnhams, um, and they were kind of, at the time when this um, item was made, at the end of the 17th century, um, they were supporters of the crown at the time when in England um, there was the English Civil War um, and uh, you know, the overthrow of the, of the crown and um, by all the former, uh, all the of parliament. Um, so it was quite interesting to see that this item was kind of around that time as well, at a time when this family, um, their kind of, uh, what they stood for was being attacked um, and then it was kind of reinstated and, and this object was part of that uh, the history of reinstating that. And I quite like trees and woods and nature and I'm slightly um, looking into a bit more of the antique furniture which I'm kind of quite interested in um, lately. So um, this is a piece of item. Um, it represents really I guess the social fabric of um, the East India Company was bringing in tea. So that's the pretext if you like. So um, in the early period of the history it was very much a social status um, to have tea and tea tables were therefore needed to represent how one was to um, have the social um, family life and etiquette. It, it became much more about, um, so for me it, it was interesting to see, I guess I got drawn into more about the artist who, was, who designed the piece rather than looking so much about the culture um, at that time about the, how they were um, accessing tea because it was a quite an expensive commodity. So I was very drawn to the artist, uh, 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 Frederick Hens. Um, when I Googled it, I was quite taken back by the fact that he was a, a deeply spiritual man, a spiritual lady, um, and 
he integrated a spirituality into the piece, which I think what brought me to it, which later I realized, because I, I kind of take quite a spiritual view in my outlook in life. Um, and that's how I got drawn to it. So I'm not going to go too much into it, but you can see one of the pictures how quite elegant it was and how people, um, particularly if you think about social classes, how people use tea uh, and, and how tea tables were an essential part of that period of life. Um, I just want to see how many people like tea and how many people like coffees, because that was one of the things I was sitting there thinking. It is very much a British culture, I guess, now these tea companies uh, and the early um, companies who uh, bought the um, spices and teas. And to me, it feels like it's part of the fabric of the British culture to have tea, like, like coffee. And towards the end, I guess it's quite personal for me, this journey. So I was reflecting on how how I ended up here as part of these two new companies as a migrant community, if you like. And um, if you read my article, it sort of kind of makes me think about, I'm from originally from a place called Select. So uh, when I last visited uh, that context, it was it's still quite thriving and people are using tea within the, uh, that uh, context as well because people see tea as quite an important part of their life. Although I'm talking about the table, but to me it represents the whole, whole piece. Um, I'm not going to go into it anymore, so I'll stop here now. Thank you. Um, just slightly long question, but it seems like you've all been involved with in this project. Do you think, had it not been for the formation of something like these DJ companies and as negative connotations, that some of these artifacts, some of the history, would not be where, where they are today? Do you think they've lost them? <laughs> so your question is that had it not been for this project, we would not have or no, these the company. The, yeah. Well, I guess if you look at other histories, it's, it's well, it's about power, isn't it? It's about access and material. So. If you have the power and influence behind it, you would want that people may have preserved and kept some of the items, but it's also luxury, it's prestige, it's also in the colonial, in the period of, you know, in that, that context, having to remember that it was a colonial um, endeavor, um, uh, exploration going across. So, yes and no. I mean, others can answer this question because it's for all of us. I think uh, we'll leave that until next time. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe I can start by maybe answering your question because when I was working on my artifact, which is the last one, uh, the last article of the book, uh, which comes from Burma, um, actually I was reading um, a book at the same time as I was working on this research, which was about uh, from a Japanese uh, author who was um, interested in the process of displaying artifacts. It was a book about how exhibiting other cultures. And so it was uh, talking about the Japanese culture and then focusing on the process of displaying and telling that actually objects from ordinary life were kind of getting a new meaning when they were exhibited, when they are displayed in a museum. They, get, they can be kind of, as you say, from ordinary life. So normal, it's, uh, people don't even really give them any meaning, it's just normal, they use it. But then when they start to be displayed in the museum, then they get really, um, yeah, they get another meaning in representing the culture they come from. So, yeah, in a way, I think maybe an object which is from ordinary life, maybe it was not important, it may disappear at a certain point when the museum, and also with the trade from the East India Company, and that's where I would come, because my object was acquired by the East India Company Museum in 1855. So this object, which was maybe something ordinary, became something really important for a few people here and they wanted to exhibit it. It was giving another meaning because this object was probably, because I didn't find the answer, displayed um, in the Paris exhibition in 1855. And it was representing also the strength of the British Empire and also um, showing their the, yeah, as I said, the relations with the other culture. So, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but yes, I think 
maybe this object would have disappeared in a way or another. So, but it's not the case for all objects. Of course. Yeah. Depends on. So, yeah. Uh, actually, I made all my presentations now. So, but um, no, as I said, my my object. So I, I decided to take this object to select this object. Um, first, you can see from the picture that looks a bit bizarre. I would say uh, for me, I was surprised by the shape of this object, and I was just curious to know a bit more about that one. Um, I selected um, Myanmar because uh, I had the opportunity to travel there, and it was just completely and I wanted to know a little bit more about uh, the culture and the history of the country. Um, and so, yeah, this artifact is a mere plug from the Kanban dynasty. Um, which ruled the uh, Burma from 1755 until 1885, sorry. And so, yeah, um, when I made this research, I was interested also because there was no much information about it, so I wanted to find a kind of challenge and just make sure that um, there was something to find out. It was quite difficult, I'd say, from the beginning. Um, but then, when I made the first research on Google about the Kanban dynasty, I found out something quite interesting, which was an I talk about that in the book, which is the sanctuary laws, meaning that um, it was inspired from Buddhism uh, in Burma, which was kind of creating um, um, a society which was quite well regulated. And these sanctuary laws were just giving a kind of physical distinction, so showing the distinction, I will explain in a few words, but like what you were wearing, what you were, how the way you were decorating your house was a way to show your social distinction and it was regulated by law I think we can see <coughs> it today you know the way we organize our homes can say a lot about our social um, origin or whatever and so yeah but there it was regulated by law and it could be you know strive to sanctions if you were not respecting them. so that was the entry point and then uh, but it wasn't helping me to find uh, the origin or it helped me a little bit afterwards um, I had the opportunity to discuss with Curator uh, John Clark, the curator at the uh, Vienna Museum, because this object actually you can see that the Vienna Museum is displayed in the Soviet in, uh, in Asia uh, department. Uh, so if you if you go to the Vienna, you will find it. And so yeah, the idea. So I went, I, I met him, and then I asked him, yeah, do you have kind of entry point for me because I'm completely lost. It's interesting uh, object, but I don't know where. It from. I know it was acquired by the Stevia company, but that was the only information I had. And um, he told me that it might have, been, uh, might have been acquired for this Paris exhibition. Um, and that was my entry point because, and I uh, won't say too much because I think it usually might be more interesting to read it, but um, the subject for me was part of diplomatic relations between Burma and the East India Company and the British. Um, uh, because at the time when it was acquired, it was just in the middle of diplomatic um, negotiations uh, for the, because the region of Peking, the south of Burma, had been um, annexed by the British at the time. And so the King Mindan was trying to get it back in a way, and then the British wanted to uh, sign a peace treaty with uh, the King. And so, yeah, there were a lot of diplomatic missions and so on, and then the, the Paris exhibition just came at the same time, I would say. And so there were links of the curators from the East India Company Museum were looking for artifacts from all around the empire to uh, display, <coughs> to be displayed in this exhibition. And so, yeah, you will read that, yeah, this interesting part between personal relationships between a king and uh, a British representative in Burma, and also, uh, yeah, what was interesting <coughs> for me in this research was really a small story, the, the, the small history was linked to the larger history. And that was really interesting. And with this question, as I said, it's a kind of background line I wanted to follow about this idea of exhibiting other cultures in a museum and the meaning which can change from its first origin or, or initial origin to the one it gets when it's exhibited in, in Europe, for example. Um, so, yeah, that was my. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
Gonna burn my heart out. 
introduce myself, a bit about my background, I'll give you a song. Uh, a bit about my background, a bit about the song is that uh, I've been associated to 
uh, two literature projects. One was a fiction writing, and I wrote a short story called Hustle and the Lost Sky Shuffle Defined the Hands of Time, and uh, looking at the Broxnabry East in the company ship. And then the other one was a non fiction item uh, talking about the, the nemesis, East in the company ship. And so um, I found out that there was um, a ship, an East India ship called uh, the Enterprise. And in my playful thinking, I was thinking, you know, Starship Enterprise like Star Trek. And uh, then I found out there was another ship called the Wolverine. So you see where I'm going with this, like Marvel Comics, the kids will like it and the youth will be into it. So you'll see the playful thinking in the song. And it's a new genre that I'm developing called uh, Sci-Fi Electronica. I hope you enjoy it. And um, I'll be leaving very shortly straight after this because I'm running a bit late. So thank you. Uh, you can run this song now. So I can't hear it. If I gave you diamonds and dowry, would you be a happy diamond lover? Not whether the diamond is the rough, but the jewel in the crown. Not whether the timber is rough, but the silver in the light of the two. I'm not to blame, you're not to blame. We're not to blame, we're not to blame. Coming out to Mother Nature So many lessons I learned my teacher If Mother Nature could show her emotions How many rivers, how many rivers, how many rivers would she cry? If the ocean should rise above the land Time has no meaning like the grains of sand If the world we knew would come to an end No more contemplation, no more pretend I think I'm going to start the new version, the Bangladesh version, here it comes. I'm going to the, I'm going to the era of the holiday in the town. Oi, Bangladesh, she will be, she will be the holiday in the town. Oi, Bangladesh, she will be, she will be the holiday in the town. Oi, Bangladesh, she will be, she will be the holiday in the town. Oi, Bangladesh, she will be, she will be the holiday in the town. Oi, Bangladesh, she will be, she will be the holiday in the town. Oi, Bangladesh, she will be, she will be the holiday in the town. Razakhi Amarki to lose, to marki to lose, Amarki to lose, Tararki to lose, Gasar is on the road, Gasar is on the road, Sunday, the Sunday, the high you will have you to show. Rosso, he did go to you, oh, the gun, and they are now, Kuna Gahan, Kuna Gahan. Thank you. 